Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm here today with Austin Lee, who served Philadelphia County between the years 1957 and 1964 as a House member. I appreciate you taking the time to be here with me today. Well, I'm delighted to be here. I wanted to begin by asking you, what kind of influence did your family have on your early life and your political aspirations? Well, uh, I was an only child, and uh, my father was a member of the Pennsylvania General Assembly from 1940 to 1950. As a matter of fact, why, uh, <clears throat> in the district I represented, why, between the Hamilton family and the Lee family, why, uh, we occupied the legislative seat for 40 years. <laughs> so that, uh, uh, so I sort of grew up in a in a political atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, so why did you decide to be part of the Republican Party? Well, I guess I inherited that, but uh, the uh, <clears throat> it it sort of conformed with my own particular feelings, and uh, so that's why I am a Republican. Okay. I still am, <laughs> even though the Republican Party hasn't always been good to me. <laughs> okay. What types of jobs or experiences did you um, have before coming to the House? Well, I was, uh, of course, in the service during World War II, and uh, I'm also an attorney. Uh, I graduated from law school and uh, was sworn in in a hangar in Florida <laughs> by a lieutenant commander in the Navy. It was, uh, I took my bar examinations before I went off in the service, and uh, so in those days, why the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania provided for absentee admissions, and uh, that was the way I got into it. And aside from that, why uh, uh, that was the only sort of experience that had any influence on my political life, uh, the fact that I was a practicing attorney. Mm -hmm. When I first came to Harrisburg, why, when somebody said unconstitutional, why, I got all upset. And uh, after I was here for a while, I shrugged my shoulders and said, that's for the courts to decide. <laughs> <laughs> Could you talk about your education? Where were you educated? Well, I <clears throat> graduated from Stanton Military Academy High School, and that's in Stanton, Virginia. And uh, then I went to the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. And then I went to the University of Pennsylvania Law School and graduated in 1943. Uh, and then immediately volunteered for the service. Mm -hmm. What can you tell me about your um, service with the, um, you d did you say it was with the Air Force or Army? No, I was in the Navy. Navy. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you didn't say that then. <laughs> no, I, did, no. Uh, I don't, don't think I said it. You said Air Force hangar and uh, that threw me. <clears throat> no, I uh, w was uh, commissioned in Ensign in the Navy and uh, I went to Jacksonville, Florida and went through Aviation Ordnance School and uh, then I went to Pensacola, Florida, and uh, went through aerial free flight instructors, uh, gunnery instructor school. And uh, then uh, I was applied for a position on the East Coast someplace, and of course, obviously, so it was sent to the West Coast. <laughs> and so I went to work in what they called CASUs, which is a Carrier Aircraft Service Union. So I was in naval aviation. And uh, eventually, why I went to school again and qualified as an aerial navigator, and uh, was assigned to the Naval Air Transport Service, and wound up on Guam. Mm. And uh, it was I was on Guam when the war ended, and I came home and was discharged and went back to the practice of law. Do you think your experience as being an attorney helped you um, whenever you came to Harrisburg? Well, it helped in being able to understand. Uh, the difference between criminal law and civil law and uh, also penalties and uh, uh, litigation and so forth and so on. So uh, uh, I think it, it helped uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a large way. Do you think your father, having been a House member, helped you in any way? Well, uh, uh, he brought me up here a couple of times uh, while he was a member, mm -hmm. so uh, I was sort of I, I knew uh, where the House of Representatives wa was, and uh, I met uh, some members, uh, some of whom were still members when I became a member. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was all sort of helpful. Well, what mo motivated you personally to run for the Pennsylvania House? I was asked to run by the political leader in my uh, district. It's as simple as that, because uh, I 
served with him on the building and loan board and uh, uh, he used to go to the local restaurant for a milkshake and he was a little overweight but uh, uh, nonetheless why we used to sit and talk for half an hour or so and then go our ways and one night why he broached the subject of uh, my possibly running for the legislature and eventually he selected me and uh, so I was elected. Well what was your first campaign like? Well of course uh, the political leadership in my district was uh, very tight and was strong in those days. They had committeemen in every every district so that uh, campaigning really uh, had to do with going to the ward committee meetings and speaking to the committee members and uh, of course after my first session why uh, I began to talk in other areas throughout the city of Philadelphia because I was sort of designated as a as a speaker and uh, I went where I was uh, asked to go and talked to other ward committees here there and the other place mm -hmm. but as far as campaigning was concerned why uh, uh, we used to print brochures and we had bumper stickers and uh, uh, we used to put little advertisements in the local newspaper not in the big metropolitan dailies but uh, that was about the size of it because the organization was strong enough so that uh, whoever they selected why well, usually they were the ones that were they were elected did you have any tight races whenever you ran <clears throat> in uh, 1960 why uh, that was the Kennedy year and I was a Republican running in a Kennedy year and uh, so when the votes were all counted up why according to our count I was ahead by 23 votes out of 20 some thousand cast and the Democrats had me down by seven. It uh, turned out that the actual margin on the unofficial returns was 23. And uh, that was without the opening of the absentee ballots, which had just come into vogue at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, after they were opened, why, uh, I was ahead by 66, and that was the final result. So were there recounts like there are today? We went, and in those days, why they had voting machines and uh, they were mechanical machines so that you could open up the back and see what the numbers were for the various candidates. And uh, so that was the only recount that there was uh, that uh, aside from the opening of the absentee ballots, which was before the county election board. And then we went to the warehouse and examined all the machines to verify that the results turned in were correct. Because you hear an awful lot about recounts, so I was just wondering if that. Yeah, well, the, the, the it's uh, it's evolved over over the years. <laughs> In your own words, could you please describe your district, um, specifically the people, their issues, um, the se you know the sections of the. Uh, county that you represented? <clears throat> well, I represented uh, an area in northwest Philadelphia, and uh, it was composed of three communities Roxborough, Maniunk, and Wissahickon. Uh, <clears throat> Roxborough was sort of up on top of the hill, Wissahickon was down in uh, one edge near the river, and Maniunk was along the river on the other side of the, the community. I would say there were 30 some uh, Protestant churches, there were five or six Catholic churches and it was a pretty cosmopolitan sort of a sort of an area. Uh, it was uh, I would say middle class in the sense that uh, there weren't a lot of uh, poor people, there, there weren't a lot of terribly rich people and uh, so that was the kind of community that I represented. As far as issues were concerned, I, uh, of course I <clears throat> at one time I think in 1960 when I was elected there were 34 Democratic representatives from the city of Philadelphia and one Republican that was me <laughs> so that uh, over the years I became involved in a lot of issues that uh, uh, spread more than my own my own district mm -hmm. of course the people in my district why all they were really concerned about were uh, things such as uh, taxes and uh, uh, then of course when the the uh, Kennedy campaign came along why uh, abortion became a, an issue and so forth so mm -hmm. that uh, uh, you know actually there, I didn't get involved in a lot of issues as far as my constituency was concerned but I did become involved in issues as far as the city of Philadelphia was concerned. Mm -hmm. 
What was the political makeup of your district? Or of well, your it, was, state? it was fairly heavily Republican, okay. that is, by registration. Okay. And that's how they, they primarily voted then, Republican? Yes. Okay. Do you still live in the neighborhood in which you served? No. I, uh, <clears throat> after I, uh, I was defeated for re-election in a primary in uh, 1964, yeah, 64, and uh, after about two or three years, why, uh, I picked up and moved to Paoli, which is in Chester County, and uh, I lived in Paoli up until about a year and a half ago when we moved to Lancaster in a retirement home. Okay. Well, what was it like serving um, for the city, in, you know, Philadelphia in a large delegation such as what you said, you were what, one of 35 people? Yeah, well, it, uh, I was friendly with uh, all the Democrats and they were, you know, friendly to me and mm -hmm. whenever we could, why we cooperated on uh, various things. Uh, <clears throat> the, I guess, uh, major issues that I was involved in, uh, some of them uh, involved statewide issues because uh, I was the principal sponsor of a bill in the 60s and I can't remember the exact time but uh, extended civil service coverage for state employees uh, made a major expansion in the civil service and that was interesting because uh, the Republicans in Harrisburg finally woke up to the fact that by extending civil service they were protecting a lot of Republicans. <laughs> so the, uh, they controlled the legislature at that time and that's why they passed it. I would say locally in Philadelphia why I can tell you where the Southeastern Pennsylvania Transportation Authority came from, SEPTA. Mm -hmm. There was a gentleman named Lennox Moak who was the executive director of the Pennsylvania Economy League. He had an office in the same building that I did. Called me one day, came down to see me, said it was time for the Transportation Authority in southeastern Pennsylvania. He said, will you help me? I said, yes. I made an appointment with Governor Scranton. And uh, Mr. Moke and I went to see the governor who was in his office along with Walter Lessandroni who was his assistant, I think, attorney general at that time. And uh, <clears throat> Moke made the presentation and uh, Scranton indicated that he was favorably disposed. So I introduced the bill and it was uh, eventually enacted in, into law. Also on the local level in Philadelphia, <clears throat> one of the big bugaboos for many years that was pushed by reformers was called city-county consolidation. and. Uh, so that uh, <clears throat> eventually in my last term, why uh, I was the principal sponsor of a bill that brought city-county consolidation about. And uh, of course that was what led to my defeat in the, the primary uh, because the political leadership in Philadelphia didn't like that. Oh, <laughs> why didn't they like it? They didn't like it because it <clears throat> meant the abolition of certain in other words, city-county consolidation meant there were officials in the city and officials in the county, and there was a lot of duplication of, of effort, and this enabled them at the local level to uh, do away with certain of those duplicate offices, and they were occupied by Republicans, so they didn't like it. <laughs> That's very interesting. Um, how, how was uh, the Philadelphia delegation viewed um, whenever they came to Harrisburg? Because Philadelphia just always seems like it has so much power and behind it. The, I think this goes back to the days even before Bowie's Penrose that uh, <clears throat> Philadelphia, I believe, at one time, because of population, had a majority of the representatives in Harrisburg. And they used to <clears throat> do what suited them, which didn't suit the rest of Pennsylvania. As a result of which, why the animosity toward Philadelphia has continued for forever, and it still exists today. That uh, they didn't like what Philadelphia did to them in those days, and uh, they've been getting revenge ever since. Mm -hmm. So, what what you talked about um, SEPTA being a special issue? Were there any other issues or things that you were involved in with the? Well, I I really can't uh, dredge up. It's been. <clears throat> what, uh, 64, 
uh, it's been what 40 yeah. some some years <laughs> uh, 43 years uh, and uh, you know I just have no particular rec recollection I was very active as a legislator and introduced a large number of bills and, uh, and many of which became law as a mm -hmm. matter of fact I used to get criticized by this so the Senate leadership who was saying well all we do is we act on Austin Lee bills and uh, so <laughs> there it is what, how did you reach your constituents whenever you were a member? Um, you know, now today we have computers that we're able to, our members are able to maybe shoot emails to their constituents. Were you able to write letters or use the telephone or how did you get your message to your constituents? The, again, I want to emphasize the fact that I was the product of a political organization okay. who, with committeemen in every division, why they went around, canvassed every household, and made the case for the Republican candidates, including me. Uh, <clears throat> I did write a few articles for the local newspaper, and uh, of course, my I was available by telephone. Although we didn't have anything that they have today, such as telephone banks and that sort of thing, uh, we didn't uh, have a lot of communication with people in the, the broad sense, uh, meaning like newsletters and mm -hmm. so forth and so on. Because in my day, why well, uh, they didn't have an expense allowance that uh, enables these people nowadays to send out newsletters uh, two or three times a year. So that uh, uh, I didn't have any, any of that. I would say that the main reason for my election was the support of the local political organization. Okay. Whenever you came to Harrisburg, did anything surprise you? As a, as a member, I mean, you already had the ex, you know the experience that your father provided you. Not really. Uh, that uh, can't say that anything particularly surprised me. Uh, of course, in those days, I think we were getting the magnificent sum of three thousand dollars a year, plus a hundred dollars in postage stamps. And a lot of the members used to sell the, the postage stamps <laughs> the day they got them for for half price, <laughs> but. Uh, it, uh, <clears throat> no, I can't say that anything in that regard. Do you recall your first office? First office? Or we didn't you have didn't, a, have, an didn't office. have an office. <laughs> the, in those days, why I had a seat uh, on the floor of the house with a brass spittoon, and uh, it was, uh, you know, a foot high, and uh, it was a gorgeous sort of thing, but uh, we used to use it as a trash can. <laughs> But in any event, why, uh, aside from that, all we had was a locker that was uh, probably three feet high and, a, and a, maybe a foot wide, and uh, that was all. There, was, there were no offices as far as members were concerned. So I'm assuming you had no secretary? Oh, no. You had a secretarial pool, and I think there were as many as maybe six ladies in the, in the pool, and if you wanted to, to <clears throat> send a letter while well, you went down to the pool and... Uh, uh, some of them didn't have very good shorthand, but uh, uh, you dictated the letter and then they uh, made it up for you to sign. But of course, remember, I was a practicing attorney, so I had a secretary in Philadelphia. So the bulk of my correspondence, why I did from my office. Okay. So you. I would only re respond to communications by constituents. Mm -hmm. Although my phone used to ring in the evening by uh, kids who had homework assignments. They wanted to know who their congressman was and who their state senator was and so forth and so on. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, And the other people who wanted an appointment to Annapolis or West Point or anything. And a lot of people used to say, why aren't you in Washington, thinking that I was a member of Congress instead of the House of Representatives in Harrisburg. So you maintained your, your law practice while you were serving oh, yes. in the Pennsylvania oh, yes. House. <clears throat> and that was because you were a part-time legislature at that time, correct? That's correct, yeah. As a matter of fact, my first session, why we were here, we came in, in January, we went home in the middle of June and didn't come back for the balance of the two-year uh, mm -hmm. uh, term. And uh, <clears throat> while I was here, why they did amend the Constitution to mm -hmm. provide for fiscal sessions in the odd-numbered years. Mm -hmm. Of course, nowadays, why they're in session almost continually. Mm -hmm. um, and you said you're, you didn't have a district office, which is something that's very common these days. No, we had no, no district office. 
but you maintain perhaps a district office sort of in your law practice? Not, not at all? Not really, uh, because my law practice was always different than my legislative activities. And <clears throat> if people wanted to see me, well, they came to my home. Okay. Or I went to see them. Uh, Very different, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Oh, From it's a lot different. <laughs> <laughs> Um, could you explain how you felt during your first swearing-in ceremony? Well, I, it, it was uh, fairly emotional uh, that uh, I can't, can't remember who was here with me because uh, uh, I remember I used to bring my children one at a time to swearing-ins. Uh, I don't remember which one it was the first time. But uh, because of my father's service and so forth, I, uh, I felt uh, you know, fairly uh, emotional, but uh, there were flowers all over the place, and uh, <clears throat> we didn't do anything. We said, I'd get sworn in. <laughs> that was all there was to it, and then we went home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Would you say anyone um, mentored you whenever you first came to Harrisburg? No, not really. Uh, that uh, I made some some firm friends among the, the the class of legislators with which I came in and uh, some of them I still have today. Uh, but uh, as, far as, as far as any mentor was concerned, why, uh, no, if they wanted your vote, why, they would come around and talk to you, but uh, aside from that, why, uh, uh, nobody sat me down and told me all the ins and outs of uh, legislation. Okay. Well, who were you sworn in with, and who would you consider to be your friends? Kenneth B. Lee, later speaker, H. Jack Seltzer, later speaker, and uh, the Honorable James S. Bowman, who is uh, the president judge of the, uh, uh, the Commonwealth Court in Harrisburg. And those were the three major friends that I made uh, during my service. Ken Beeley, no relation, right? No, no relation at all. And he was another one whose his son uh, later was a member and of course my father was a member. So very confusing for everybody. <laughs> yeah, <sure>. right. <laughs> Would you say you had the opportunity to mentor anybody while you were here? Did uh, you t sit down anybody and tell them? I helped uh, a guy named James C. Humes, okay. who was a member from Lycoming County, I think. And uh, aside from that, the only other one that I sort of helped a little bit was Robert Butera. Uh, who came from Montgomery County. Mm -hmm. But I, mentoring was not uh, mm -hmm. a big thing in those days. Mm -hmm. What type of relationship did you have with um, the speakers that were here? Obviously, you, you mentioned two speakers that you were friendly with, so. Well, the first speaker was uh, Stuart Helm, and uh, <clears throat> I didn't have any, you know, we knew each other and so forth. Uh, I wouldn't say that there was any particular relationship uh, Hiram Andrews and Robert Hamilton were Democrats, and <clears throat> while I knew them, uh, why uh, there wasn't any particular relationship then. And I think I guess Helm was the speaker again in my my last session. Mm -hmm. Did you have any relationship with the governors? I mean, obviously, you, you uh, said you had numerous bill <clears throat> signs, so I'm just that's why I'm thinking maybe. I guess. Uh, I'm just trying to think. Governor Leader, I think, was the governor in my first session. And of course, he was a Democrat, <coughs> so I had no particular relationship with him. Had no particular relationship with uh, Dave Lawrence, and uh, <coughs> I guess the last governor was Bill Scranton, and uh, I was one of the first ones who came out for Bill Scranton to be governor. He was then a congressman from uh, uh, the coal region. And uh, <clears throat> I met him and uh, sort of uh, uh, kibitzed as far as his campaign was concerned. Uh, but uh, and we were, we were fairly friendly. And I have a nice letter from him uh, uh, thanking me for my contributions and so forth and so on. What? You, you've already mentioned um, some legislation and issues that you were involved in. Can you talk about some of those other things that you were involved in? What do you mean, like the Bipartisan Management Committee? Not yet. Not yet, okay. <laughs> um, I wanted to hear a little bit more about the Commonwealth um, Civil Service. 
um, the expansion of that. Yeah. You, you, t you just mentioned it. I was wondering if you could tell me what were some of the um, issues that were involved in expanding well, it and who was involved. Of course, civil service is always a matter of sort of controversy between labor unions and uh, the administration or the, the, the general public and so forth and so on. Because the unions want a low threshold in order to get a job and a high threshold in order to get rid of an employee. As far as everybody else is concerned, they want it just the other way around. They want a high threshold to be sure the person is competent and to get in, and then they want a low threshold going out. And uh, of course, Pennsylvania was uh, one of those states that had a large number of patronage employees. And uh, the idea was that uh, so many of them were in their positions, they knew what they were doing, they were experts in this, that, or the other, and so forth and so on. And the idea was to give them some sort of uh, uh, job protection uh, so that they couldn't just be fired uh, just because political leadership in the state changed. So that, uh, in essence, was what it was all about. It was, uh, in my view, a, a good concept and uh, something that should have been done, and it was done. Um. Something else that I think you had marked down as one of your accomplishments was the inheritance and estate tax of 1962. Yeah, my practice was mainly in wills and estates. <clears throat> I was a member of the legislative task force of the Joint State Government Commission mm -hmm. at that time and sat in on the drafting sessions by the advisory committee and uh, eventually I became the principal sponsor of the legislation when it was introduced in the House. I introduced it and uh, uh, pushed it to, to be sure that it got enacted, and it was. And okay. it's still on the books. It's been amended a number of times since then, but uh, it's, uh, it's still in existence. Well, what were the issues around, surrounding that particular piece of legislation? <laughs> well, there was a, the Joint State Government Commission uh, when my father was a member, he was a member of the Legislative Task Force, and uh, they set about to revise the laws relating to wills, intestacies, and estates in Pennsylvania. And uh, they had completed that by the time I became a member, and uh, so that they moved on to inheritance taxes, and uh, that was what I participated in uh, as a member. Okay. So there was just the, the sort of the end of a of a series of activities in that field of the law. So it, now it's complete? Yeah. Okay. Um, never, never complete. <laughs> <laughs> More amendments. <laughs> um, something else that you had listed, um, you were a co-sponsor of the bill to have Pennsylvania participate in the Kerr-Mills <laughs> Act of Congress, which was the forerunner to Medicare, I think. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> back in the, the early 60s, why Congress passed what was known as Kerr Mills, <clears throat> which set up a system of assistance, medical assistance, to aged persons. The Democratic administration in Pennsylvania dragged their feet on implementing that law because they were trying to force the adoption of what later became known as Medicare. And uh, I took the position that, well, why should we wait? Uh, we have uh, <clears throat> the opportunity to help our aged uh, citizens and uh, let's go ahead. So I remember making a speech before a group of social workers in Philadelphia and uh, the Democratic leader came to me afterwards and said, wow, <laughs> said, uh, you really uh, uh, lit a fire under a lot of people. And uh, so in any event, why eventually why the bill was introduced in order to uh, implement the uh, Kerr Mills uh, legislation. Hmm. An interesting sidelight to that was that uh, in the appropriation hearings that year where the uh, Department of Welfare came in and uh, we were asking him a lot of questions and finally I said to him, I said, well, you know, won't you qualify uh, in the various uh, uh, homes that you operate for medical assistance for these, these people? And they looked at me and said, why, yes. And I said, well, uh, why don't you come back uh, tomorrow and give us an estimate of how much that's going to amount to? Mm -hmm. And they came back the following day with an estimate of $2 million for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So that, uh, that was uh, uh, 
something that I was sort of sort of pleased to be able to do. Mm -hmm. What do you think is key in your mind to getting legislation passed? Well, the first thing, there has to be a need for it. And uh, <clears throat> what you do in the legislation has to comport with all of the, there may be competing interests as far as the legislation is concerned. And sometimes why you take one side uh, and say that's the way it ought to be. Other times you try to reach a compromise and uh, uh, you know advocate something that's sort of sort of middle ground. So I would say that you have to be careful in advocating legislation as to who's for it and who's against it and make your accommodation. I remember saying to Paul Beers, who's the historian for the House of Representatives one time, I said, legislation is the search for consensus. That uh, that's, that's what it's all about. You've got to, to get to a point where you have the consensus of a majority of the members in the House and the Senate uh, that this is the right thing to do for one reason or another. They may not like it, but uh, they have reasons as to why they should do it. Mm -hmm. You sat on a number of committees, including the Banking Committee, uh, First Class Cities, and Appropriations, and you served as Vice Chairman of that committee. Could you describe um, what the committee structures were like at that time, and any thoughts on some of the types of legislation that may have come through those committees? Well, I don't have any, <clears throat> aside from the ones we've talked about, which I consider to be you know, major pieces of legislation, I don't have any real recollection of uh, uh, any earth-shaking things. <clears throat> uh, I guess one of them was the community college concept in Pennsylvania because there was a lot of agitation at one time. This was when I was on appropriations uh, for the establishment of community colleges because <clears throat> after World War II, like Pennsylvania was very fortunate because we had a system of 13 state teachers colleges so that uh, when the push came with the GI Bill and so forth to expand educational facilities, we had 13 colleges around the state, all of whom had libraries and gymnasiums and a lot of the infrastructure that goes with the, with the college and all they had to do was build more buildings to house the students and uh, as a result of which why then they got into the, the community college concept and there was a lot of pressure to make those four-year institutions which I opposed and uh, so what eventually passed was uh, the community colleges basically are two-year institutions the idea being that they're a springboard for the people who succeed to go on to a, a four-year college. Mm -hmm. What about the committee structure? Can you talk about... Um, well the committee structure in those days was, <clears throat> didn't amount to, to a lot. There was a chairman he had the right to call up bills for consideration. Uh, most of the consideration was fairly perfunctory. I can't remember uh, any, aside from the community college thing, and uh, perhaps the educational bills for the uh, city of Philadelphia, where there was a lot of uh, debate or controversy or conferences and so forth and so on. As a matter of fact, on education in Philadelphia, why I was sort of a a leading advocate for <clears throat> funding of the Philadelphia School District. And uh, I sort of stood alone, but uh, nonetheless, why uh, we used to sit down with the people from appropriations and eventually why the uh, executive director of the school district, why he was outside and I would go out to him and say, well, they'll, they'll agree to this. And he had his assistant who would get out his little calculator and say, well, that is okay or it's not okay. And I'd go back. And so uh, eventually why well, we'd uh, agree on a, on a figure and that was what was in the appropriation bill, mm -hmm. uh, or the authorization bill, because that's another thing that uh, I was involved in. In those days, why the school board in Philadelphia had to come to Harrisburg to get authorization to levy a school tax in Philadelphia. And uh, <clears throat> I was the principal sponsor of the so-called Educational Home Rule Act for Philadelphia, which turned the ability to levy school taxes over to the school district in Philadelphia with the approval of city council. And 
So that was one that I'd sort of forgotten about. Did uh, commi the committees have research staff? No. No. <laughs> Do you know when that came about? <clears throat> Basically, I think it was in Kenneth Lee's speakership, he authorized a resolution for a study of the operation of the, of the House. I think that in the Feynman era, era why they began to add staff and so forth and so on. And uh, so eventually why uh, the staff uh, got to be fairly, fairly substantial. Every year or so uh, they expanded the, the appropriations and uh, hired more, more staff. Mm -hmm. they're at the present time, why almost every committee has two or three uh, uh, or sometimes more uh, staff persons assigned to a particular committee. Mm -hmm. Okay, this, this is, we're going to start leading into the BMC question. <laughs> um, so, do you think it was a good idea to start adding staff, uh, oh, oh, coming yes. at it from a, a member's point of view? Somebody oh, that... Certainly, uh, certainly. Okay, so yeah. professionalization was because, a good thing. <clears throat> yeah, okay. and uh, of course, you, you, you know, it, there's a political atmosphere so that uh, not all the employees are there because of their particular expertise. Uh, some of them are, are hired uh, just to be hired. Others are there because of their expertise. And, uh, but I think that the staffing of the committees was a, was a good thing because it provided a, a larger background of uh, information as far as any piece of legislation was concerned. Mm -hmm. um, some other expansions in staff were adding uh, secretaries to each member and giving them their own private offices. Mm -hmm. All good things? I think so, yeah. Uh, that, uh, <clears throat> you know, not everybody was in the position I was in where I had a secretary uh, uh, in my office that uh, I could rely on for correspondence. <clears throat> as far as members are concerned, in this day and age of more instant communication, why I'm sure they get a lot more uh, inquiries and input and so forth from constituents and uh, they have to respond to it. And uh, in order to do so, well, you, you need somebody. Uh, you also need somebody to man your office in Harrisburg when you're not there and uh, to field the calls and uh, uh, take appropriate action, either communicating with you or uh, doing what uh, the person has requested or referring it to somebody who can. Mm -hmm. Did you see any changes towards this process while you were here? Well, of course, I was here at two separate times. Mm -hmm. I came back after my House membership 14 years later. Jack Seltzer, whom I represented previously, mm -hmm. was the minority leader. And when he was elected, why he called me on the phone, said he was <clears throat> elected minority leader he had 300 employees. He didn't know who they were or what they were doing. Would I come up here and help him? And uh, so I said, yes, I would. <clears throat> so I came, and uh, uh, I think in the fall of the prior year, the Philadelphia Inquirer had run a series of seven articles on the Pennsylvania legislature out of control. And they talked about the expense accounts and all this kind of business and indicated that uh, things were just uh, in a terrible state uh, and so forth. So that uh, in the fall of the, or the spring of the year when I was appointed as the uh, executive assistant to the minority leader, why uh, they adopted a resolution for a study to be made of the House of Representatives chaired by a former representative named John Pittenger and uh, I was designated as an ex officio member of that committee and sat through all of the, the hearings. As a matter of fact, I have the, the report of the, of the committee. And uh, when the report was uh, finally issued in the fall of that year, that was an election year, and lo and behold, why the Republicans won control of the House of Representatives and my friend Mr. Seltzer was named as the speaker. He then said to me, now we have this report, that committee you were messing around with, uh, uh, why, uh, why don't you draw the legislation? <clears throat> so I sat down, 
referred to other states that had similar legislation and uh, prepared a, a bill. And uh, we consulted with the, the Democratic caucus and we had a lot of input as far as they were concerned. I think the most unique thing about it was uh, the composition of the so-called bipartisan management committee. It's composed of five members, uh, three majority and two minority. But the important thing is that in order to do anything, they had to have four votes, which meant that the minority always had a, a veto over anything that was, uh, was done. And uh, so in any event, why well, that eventually was translated into House Bill 777, which was uh, enacted uh, and took effect on December the 10th, 1979. Uh, and uh, so that then uh, <clears throat> they met, the bipartisan committee was uh, specified by statute, the speaker, the two floor leaders and the two whips, why well, they comprised the bipartisan management committee and they had a meeting and I was selected. They were going to do a national search for an executive director and I said to him, I said, well, you're going to have egg on your face if you do a national search and you wind up selecting somebody that you know from back here. So you better be careful. As a result of which, why they made me the executive director. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and a lady named Deborah Medvik was the assistant executive uh, director and uh, so we were faced with the proposition of uh, trying to implement the provisions of the act. The act <clears throat> provided in background the employees of the House of Representatives every time there was a change in political control why uh, they had to go and get a sponsor <clears throat> and people were fired and people were hired and so forth and so on. But there were a lot of people who were doing things such as the reporters, uh, the uh, storeroom, uh, the procurement office, the comptroller's office, and so forth and so on. The people in there who had acquired expertise in what they were doing and so forth and so on. And there was near, near, really no reason uh, for them to be subject to this uh, political whipsawing. And that was what part of the background for the creation of the bipartisan management committee. I think the leadership finally recognized that uh, these people were worthwhile and uh, we ought to give them some sort of protection. And uh, as a result of which, why uh, the, that was when we adopted the concept of core, which meant that basically all of the housekeeping functions of the House of Representatives were centralized in uh, one area under the chief clerk and uh, that was uh, what was done. Mm -hmm. We abolished the office of the secretary of the house which was a nothing office. He didn't do anything except occupy a chair and cash a paycheck and uh, <clears throat> so that uh, that sort of in a shorthand way was uh, what we did. Now there were I think 30 some recommendations by this committee and uh, a large number of them were implemented and uh, have been uh, in effect for a long time, including your office uh, mm -hmm. of archivist, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, I don't think I had anything to do with the original establishment of that. There was a lady named Jackie Jumper who used to, uh, you know, con collect whatever she could, and uh, but the office sort of evolved from there. Yes, it did. <laughs> and uh, but uh, it was uh, we set up an internship uh, program and uh, <clears throat> we developed a set of personnel rules and regulations uh, which was uh, quite an interesting operation. It took us months uh, to come together on all that but we finally did that, had pay ranges and classes and so forth and so on so that uh, we, in my view, I, we went a long way to putting the office on a, on a professional basis. Well, you talked about the seven articles that were written, or the series that were written in the Philadelphia Inquirer yeah. before. Do you think, um, what, what else was the climate like uh, leading up to this committee to investigate and to make recommendations? Because I think we're looking at similar times, 30, almost 30 years later, you know. Oh, I, I think that's, uh, that's, that's true, because in many ways, why the bipartisan management committee and the chief clerk uh, they've been 
in existence and in operation. And in many ways, I uh, can see that uh, <clears throat> it may be that even though we didn't think about it way back then, why uh, they probably ought to be consolidated in some, some way. And there, really, there ought to be one person in, in charge. And uh, because uh, back in those days, why everybody was all excited about R&D. In other words, they, they had to have Tweedledum and Tweedledee. <laughs> and uh, that's why I wound up with a co-executive director, because uh, the Democrats wanted somebody as, uh, as a co-executive director equal to, to me. And you know, I uh, shrugged my shoulders and said, all right, if that's what you want, well, that's fine. And uh, he and I got along very well. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and who was that? His name was Robert Hendershot. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he was a, a, an employee uh, of the state for some time, but a very capable guy, and uh, we did well together mm -hmm. because we sort of complemented each other. You served as executive director for 10 years, correct? Yes, yes. Can you talk about the duties that you experienced as executive director and some of the issues that you faced? <clears throat> I would say the main issues that we faced were the construction of the uh, bipartisan hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mentioned the fact that uh, the Comptroller's Office was important. They processed all the payrolls and, they, uh, and also the expense accounts. And uh, in other words, I had to get into that and uh, to systematize a lot of the things that they were doing. The simple things. In <clears throat> those days, they used to keep all the payroll records in bound books that were entered by hand. We computerized all that. We now have all the payroll records from the time I became executive director on microfiche. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, in other words, a whole, uh, uh, <clears throat> a whole year's worth of payroll is, is about the size of a, of a dinner napkin. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, uh, you know, I mentioned the intern uh, program and uh, the, uh, the storeroom, the uh, the procurement office, uh, oh, there used to be lots of things that uh, used to go on. In other words, uh, we established the process of surplus goods went to the Commonwealth surplus. Uh, that uh, where if the members wanted these things, why they could go to the Commonwealth surplus and buy it at an auction or, or whatever, instead of being uh, dealt something under the table. Uh, uh, in a sort of an informal sort of way, mm -hmm. but uh, it. Uh, I was just trying to trying to think what else there was uh, that to be. In other words, the personnel policies and regulations. Why that kept me busy for uh, a long time. But then there also were the complaints by members because they would go to leadership and complain about me, and I wouldn't do this and I wouldn't do that, and I said no to this and no to that, and. Uh, at least as far as the leaders were concerned, why that was one of the important things about the Bipartisan Management Committee was in order to fire me, well, they had to get four votes. <laughs> <laughs> so that, uh, you know, the, especially Matthew Ryan and even Jim Mandarino, why they, uh, they stood behind me. Mm -hmm. And uh, they figured that I knew the difference between right and wrong and uh, that, uh, you know, whatever I did was okay. I never had a leader come to me and try to get me to change a decision that I made. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's, uh, that was a, a good thing. Because mm -hmm. I didn't need the job. And uh, so I, you know, I, I shrugged my shoulders and said, you know, if you want to can me, well, I, uh, help yourself. <laughs> Do you recall any of the projects that you were involved in as executive director? Um, I think the East Wing project may have been going on about that time. <laughs> I was the liaison between the House of Representatives and General Services for the construction of the East Wing. And uh, that was a <clears throat> sort of a fascinating uh, experience. We used to have meetings uh, usually uh, uh, once every, uh, at least once a month, uh, if not uh, earlier, sooner than that, uh, with Wally Barron. The, Mm -hmm. uh, who was then the General Services uh, uh, Secretary. And, uh, you know, all sorts of problems were brought up and discussed. And we got into furniture and furnishings. And uh, 
where there was also beam 5466 because you know when you have a driveway that goes down and then goes up you can't measure the clearance from the bottom you have to figure that a vehicle is going to have wheels on both of the slopes and therefore if you measure 13 feet 6 inches from the bottom of the slope why the truck that will clear 13 6 inches is not going to clear and that's a that's the sort of thing that we ran into in connection with the construction also the uh, they had a set of marble steps uh, and uh, the our people the house employees had to bring everything up that set of steps it was only five or six steps but uh, some of the things that were brought in such as uh, reams of paper and so forth were quite heavy and uh, so we had to those, those are the sort of things that came into, uh, into the view in connection with the monitoring of that building back there. Mm -hmm. um, was, I think, was there a federal investigation at that time um, involving Senator Fumo and ghost voting? Or was, that, was that under your, your uh, realm? No, I don't. Uh, <clears throat> there was no investigation of Fumo during during my years, at least that I know of. No, the Sean Franny investigation was <clears throat> when I, when Jack Seltzer became the speaker, why a guy named Charles Mevis, who was a former member, became the chief clerk. Mm -hmm. And uh, within about three months, why he called me on the phone, he says, the FBI is here. <laughs> and so uh, I went down and told him, I said, well, whatever you want, why write us a letter and tell us and give us the authority that you have to demand it and so forth. And, uh, but I think it had to do with the Sean Franny investigation involving ghost employees. Okay, and he was eventually convicted. Okay. Um, <clears throat> do you think more um, measures need to be taken today to, um, to maybe increase some of the oversight, the bipartisan management committee has over its members or or do you think well, I, I have no way of knowing at this stage of the game okay as to what's going on as far as oversight is concerned as far as I was concerned why uh, <clears throat> expense accounts why whenever they had a problem in the comptroller's office with expenses they came to me and I made a decision mm -hmm. one way or the other either it has a legislative purpose or it doesn't if it didn't, why uh, we don't uh, we don't approve it, and uh, we also ran across hanky panky uh, by members submitting uh, you know expense accounts, and uh, that uh, you know whenever we caught up with it, why we were nice about it, but we said uh uh no no more. Do you feel that politics is conducted differently today than it is, you know, or was during your service? Um. I don't think so. Not uh, in a in any major sort of way. Uh, I think uh, <clears throat> you know politics may have been. I, I well, I, I take it. I, I didn't say it, but I'll take it back before I say it, because today's <clears throat> rancorous relationships between the two parties, in my view, are just uh, it's inexcusable, because. Uh, uh, there's no real reason as to why they should be at each other's throats all the time. And uh, I, I would say back in the days when I was a member, why, you know, they had political agendas and so forth and so on, but uh, there wasn't a lot of personal rancor because, uh, you know, you could uh, argue on the floor of the house and go out to dinner that night. Uh, it was uh, uh, all in the day's work. Mm -hmm. Uh, you also said you sat on the the Pennsylvania State Ethics Commission. Yeah. Um, can you tell me about your role in that? Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, Matthew Ryan, uh, who was the speaker, why uh, he called me in one day and said, "How about the State Ethics Commission?" And I said, "I'll think about it." And so I agreed to serve, and uh, <clears throat> my observation was in my entire service. 10 years, there was only one vote when I suspected that political influence was involved. And uh, I think that by and large, as far as the members were concerned of the Ethics Commission, uh, they 
took their position seriously. They were conscientious and uh, they did uh, what they considered to be the right thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember that uh, when they passed the legislative or the, the lobbyist uh, Regulation and Disclosure Act, I, I was the chairman of the committee to do the regulations and we, we spent hours and days uh, on the regulations under the act and of course then the Supreme Court declared it all unconstitutional. So, <laughs> You served um, in government in many capacities. Which role did you enjoy the most? BMC. It was sort of day-to-day -day problems to be solved and uh, I enjoyed uh, solving them and uh, interacting with the leadership because, of course, my attitude with leadership uh, in those days was that uh, if I decided to do something, why well, I wrote a memorandum mm -hmm. and I sent it to him. I said, unless I hear from you uh, within a certain period of time, why well, I'm going to do it. And uh, that always worked. <laughs> Did you have the opportunity to serve as a speaker pro tem? Oh, yes. Yeah. Did you enjoy that? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, of course, those back in those days, why Eddie Moore was the was the parliamentarian, and uh, he was just an unbelievable resource because he went back forty some years, uh, and uh, but uh, he used to to coach me as to say, your voice is too harsh, you know, soften up, uh, and so forth. But uh, when I would say this bill has been read three times at length, and so forth. <clears throat> but uh, no, I enjoyed that, uh, and I used to get called on, uh, you know, not a lot of times, but uh, occasionally. Mm -hmm. What are your fondest memories of the house when you think back? I'd say the friendships, the, the associations that I had with, with people, and uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, as I say, why well, some of them are friendships that uh, can continue today. I, Saw so Jack Seltzer within last February in Arizona, and uh, so we've been firm social friends for a long time. Of course, we both belong to the Yacht Club in Stone Harbor, so that was uh, part of it. Very nice. <laughs> um, what would you say if you had to rank one accomplishment? What was what would be your greatest accomplishment? BMC. BMC. The yeah. creation of it. Yeah, I, I think it was something that uh, its time had come, and it was something that was needed. And, uh, you know, I, I just hope that uh, <clears throat> in the present climate where there's some feeling as far as the needs change, why I hope they behave themselves and uh, do it in the right way. Because, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, I've known Roger Nick, the chief clerk, a long time, and he's a very competent uh, sort, of, sort of person. Uh, I've known uh, Pete Wambach and Susan uh, in a, well, in a, sort of a professional sort of way, and, uh, but I understand Pete's going to retire, so the mm -hmm. time is coming when they have the opportunity to, to do something. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what aspect of being a representative did you enjoy the most? I, I would say uh, <clears throat> the sponsoring of legislation in which I either, uh, in other words, uh, strongly believed or did to accommodate somebody else, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, so that uh, I think that was the aspect that most appealed to me. Okay, what did you like the least? <laughs> I, I would say, oh, the sort of behind the scenes sort of stuff that uh, that went on, and uh, <clears throat> you know, <laughs> and. Uh, you know, somebody was always trying to get an edge on somebody else and always uh, trying to submarine and so forth and so on. I, I think that, to me, why that was uh, uh, the worst part of it, that, uh, uh, in other words, I enjoyed the positive aspects but didn't like the negative. Mm -hmm. Are you still involved in politics? No. Officially retired? Yep. <laughs> Can you talk briefly about well, the, when I was on the ethics commission? Why I wasn't allowed, <clears throat> which was a, a blessing in a way because you can't contribute. <laughs> so I, I, when I got all those letters, why uh, I put them in the, the trash can. Mm -hmm. 
Um, since you've left the House, you were involved in the Ethics Commission for 10 years, did yeah. you say? Yes. Um, what, what have you been doing since that time? I guess that would take well, us up I'm, to about 2001. <laughs> I had a stroke in uh, June of 2000, and uh, you can see why it wasn't, uh, didn't affect me too much, knock on wood. And, uh, but I figured that it was time for me to, to quit. At that time, I was still engaged in the practice of law. And, uh, but I'm still engaged, but I'm trying to retire, I'm not taking any new clients, and uh, I'm working things down to the point where in the foreseeable future, why I'll be completely over and done with it and completely retired. Well, that's wonderful yeah. that you're still well, practicing. I, but I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, <laughs> if you had some advice to give to a new member that will be starting soon, what would it be? I'd, I'd just say uh, be honest with yourself, uh, be honest and above board with your constituents and uh, uh, don't get involved in the uh, negative side of politics. That, uh, in other words, uh, you know, respect your opponents but uh, don't uh, hold grudges and so forth and so on. And uh, that's, uh, to me, why that's the most important thing as far as they're concerned. My last question, how would you like to be remembered? As a, an effective legislator. I think I was effective not only as a legislator, but also as, a, as the executive director of the BMC. And I think I also was effective as far as the Ethics Commission was concerned. So I would like to be remembered as effective in all three capacities. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. This Thank you. This concludes our interview.